Hello, my name is Mark Baggett, and I am the course author of SANS SEC 573, Automating Information Security with Python. SEC 573 is designed to give intermediate, beginner, and people with absolutely no programming skills at all the ability they need to automate information security tasks. The course has no prerequisite requirements as is, and is designed to meet you at your current skill level and advance your ability to create productive tools. In the course, we teach the skills required to develop tools to conduct offensive, defensive, and forensics operations. Today I want to show you a tool that is the practical application of the skills that we teach in the class. We're going to be looking at a Python-based forensics tool called SrumDump. After I've shown you the tool, I'll demonstrate a tip that will be helpful to those of you that already know how to code in Python. If you'd like to learn more about how to develop your own tools, please check out the description of the course. SRUM is short for System Resource Utilization Monitor, and all of our modern Windows systems keep statistics on the processes that have been running on our computers. You can see the accumulation of these statistics underneath the Application History tab in the Task Manager. But this is just the accumulation of that data. So you can see the, the grand totals, but the details that make up those totals is often even more interesting. And all of that information is kept in a file called srudb.dat. The database srudb.dat is in your Windows directory under System32 SRU, and this file is locked by the operating system. Now, if you try to make a copy of this file in order to do analysis on it, it may appear as though you successfully copied that file. But when you give it to a tool that analyzes it, oftentimes they'll give you bogus results or just won't work because that file is actually corrupt. If you want to get a good copy, you need to use a tool that will allow you to make copies of locked files. Now if you're dealing with a forensics image such as a disk dump or a dead copy of a hard drive, then you can just grab a copy of the file and not worry about it being locked. However, if you're dealing with a live system, that file will be locked by the operating system and you'll need to use a utility such as Hobocopy, Microsoft's Robocopy with the slash B option, the Invoke Ninja Copy, PowerShell script that's part of the PowerSploit framework, HB Gary's FGET utility, or some other means such as grabbing it from a volume shadow copy to get a good copy of the database. Once you have a copy of the database, you are ready to analyze it with SrumDump. SrumDump is a free utility and it's available at the link you see here on the slide on my GitHub. And what it does is it has a template spreadsheet that defines which fields we want to re, uh, extract from the srumdb.dat file and calculations that we want to perform on those fields. And then it creates a new spreadsheet that's based upon the information in the srudb.dat file and the template. You can also give the utility a copy of the software hive from the registry, which is usually located under Windows System32 config software, and it will do additional analysis on that file to provide a more complete picture of what was going on on the system. So let's look at a demonstration of how we can use the SRUM dump utility. So the first thing I want to do is open up a command prompt here and show you the command line options for SRUM dump. So I'll do a SRUM dump dash help and our help will come up and here you can see it takes in a couple of different options. It's got an input file, or an output file, a template, and a registry hive. Now you don't have to run it from the command line. You can also just double click on the executable inside of Windows and it will then prompt you for those same fields. So here it asks me for my SRUM database. I can do a drag and drop of an, an unlocked copy and drop it into the command prompt, press enter. It'll ask me for my output file. I can give it the name of my output file. It asks me for my template. I'm just going to press enter and select the default template. And then it asks me for a software hive, so I'll drag and drop that into the system. But I do want to run it from the command line and pass all the options, so let's go ahead and run it. So I'm going to run SRUM dump, tell it my in file is the srudb.dat. My template's out, and excuse me, my template is going to be the default template. I'm going to create a file called out, and then I'm going to tell it to use the registry software hive. 
and you can see it begins analyzing the file. Now, as my cake has already been cooked here, we're going to jump over and take a look at what's in the results file. In the network usage tab, you can see that there's a couple of different fields. There's the, the SRUM uh, timestamp for the event. There's the application that's been running. We've got the user ID that ran it. I've got the wireless network that I was connected to, as well as various statistics about the information that was transmitted and received across the network connection. All of this is just on this one main tab. So from just looking at this tab, imagine a user created a fake account and then ran some malware and then deleted the account and uh, the malware from the system. Uh, by just looking at this tab, I could see the names of those deleted processes, the names of the deleted account, and then if they connected to a wireless network, I would see that and how much data was transferred. We've got these other tabs as well, such as the application usage tab, which tells me every single process that ran, how much time it had in the foreground, how much time it had in the background, and so forth. We have uh, the network connections tab, which tells me all of the wireless connections that this person connected to, what the connection time was, what the connection duration was, and by using the SRUM dump date and time stamps over here, plus the connected time, we can tell exactly where a person was by looking at the wireless networks that they were connected to and how long they were there. We've also got some other information um, such as uh, battery usage and things like that. So we can see the battery charge that was associated with, with this thing. You can see there's two different tabs for the energy usage. You've got a long-term energy tab and then short-term. So short-term only keeps like the last 30 days, but long-term you can go back much further. And this is all the great information that's being kept in this database. And this can be useful to you whether you're a penetration tester, whether you're an incident responder, or whether you're a forensics analyst. So that's SRUM Dump. Now I'd like to change gears on you for a minute and show you a little Python coding trick that I like to use to convert binary data that I might find inside of a forensics image or a network artifact and convert it into a human readable format. Now this trick is a more advanced trick for those of you who already know how to use Python, but I think that you'll find it to be useful. So I'm going to be using the iter tools module, and in the iter tools module there is a method called compress, and compress is intended to compress pieces of data. Compress takes in two lists of items, and it compresses the first list based upon the items that are in the second list. So here you can see I'm calling compress and I'm giving it two lists. The first list contains the letters in the word hello, and the second list contains ones and zeros. And anytime there's a one in that second list, it's going to include the corresponding letter from the first list list in the results. Anytime there's a zero in the second list, it will not include the results. So here you can see the results from calling compress, passing it in hello with the list of ones and zeros you see there, is the letters H, E, and O are returned from the results. But the two L's are left out because their spaces in the second list contain zeros. This can be very useful in converting binary data. Now another thing that I'm going to need for this is the ability to take a decimal number and convert it into a list of ones and zeros. Well, it's pretty easy to take a decimal number and turn it into a binary number. We can use a format string in order to do that. So here I'm going to use the format string to take the decimal number 250 and turn it into an 8-bit binary number with leading zeros. And you can see that that returns a string that contains the associated ones and zeros. If I take the results of that and then pass that to the map function and map the integer function across that string, then what I get back is a list of ones and zeros for the decimal number 250. By combining these two techniques, I can create a function such as you see here called TCP flags. TCP flags takes in a decimal number and it returns back a list of what TCP flags would be set from that binary number. You can see here we create a list called flags that contains the strings that are associated with each of the flags. And then what I do is I take the decimal number and first turn it into that list of ones and zeros. I use iter tools compress to combine that list of ones and zeros 
with the flags list that has the text values for each of those ones and zeros, and I get back a list of text flags. So let's experiment with this and see what it looks like. So here I'm going to open up Python. You can see I've already got my function typed out. Uh, first thing I need to do is I need to import the iter tools module. So I'll import iter tools. Now I've got everything I need to call my function. So let's call the TCP flags function and let's just give it the number 2. And 2 says that's a sin flag. Now let's try 18. Well, that's a sin ack. And let's try last of 16, which is the ack. So there you can see the three values associated with our TCP handshake and how easily we can combine those tools to create a nice little Python function. Okay. So whether you've never coded before and you want to learn how to build utilities like Srumdump or you're a beginner to intermediate coder who wants to learn new techniques such as the shortcuts I've shown you in this video, we've got a couple of opportunities for you to come and take 573 in the near future. In May, we've got Joff Thayer teaching in Northern Virginia. And in July, Joff is again teaching in Australia. And then I'll be teaching 573 in July in Washington, D.C. at Sandsfire. And there's opportunities for you to show your peers and employers just how awesome you are. We got the SANS SEC 573 coin that goes to the winners of the Capture the Flag. And of course, GIAC now has this awesome GIAC Python Coder Certification GPYC available to you. So check those out. Thanks for your time. Have a nice day.